Okay, that's all that, that I have. I don't really need to introduce Bill because you, you all know who he is. And uh, we are expecting a great time tonight. So, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Years ago, there was a show on called Dragnet. <laughs> the names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> this is my show. Yes. The names have not been changed. <laughs> no one in candor is innocent. <laughs> I hope not to offend anyone if I did, or if I do, oh well. <laughs> I want to take you back through a period of uh, the history of Candor when Candor was a wonderful, wonderful place to live. The kids could run the streets without fear of being hurt, without the fear of being abducted, unless it was some of their friends who abducted them and took them out and let them out in the hills. I was in on that too. <laughs> But from 1962 to 1968, many of you and myself were part of the history of Candor, New York. It was during the 50s that I think we had the best decade in our history, when we didn't have the wars going on, and then we got into the 60s and came Vietnam. <coughs> And I got to take the news to everybody. As you see, I was Newsboy of the Week. <laughs> the fourth one in the Ithaca Journal Newsboy of the Week program, and it was in April of uh, 1965. I was 15 years old in that picture, and I weighed about 82 pounds. <laughs> It was in May of 1962 that an announcement came across the loudspeaker. Principal Dallas K. Martin. There is an opening and a need for a newspaper carrier boy for the Ithaca Journal. Oh boy. I was 12 years old. I should have asked my parents if I could take the job. But I knew I would lose it if I did, so I went right down to the office and said, I will take that job. Twelve years old, I went home and told my mother, I'm going to work. <laughs> the first route I had was the upper part of town. It was 26 customers. Within a short time, the lower part of town, they quit. I was asked if I would take on another 25 customers. And within a short time, I was up to 78 customers. And by the end of my stint, two days before I left for college, I was at 126 people on my paper route. Not only did I have the paper route, but many of you will remember I worked for five years at Johnny's Market. <coughs> That's a separate evening uh, story. <laughs> and during one summer, I worked at Johnny's Market, did the papers, and went early in the morning to Butterfly Pastry Shop in Ithaca, where I was a baker's assistant, mostly washing pots and pans. <laughs> but let's go back to that time in 1962. A wonderful time. A time where when you went in the summer vacation, your big day was to be at the dam at noon to learn to swim. Larry Hines was the instructor. Many times he tried to drown me, but he didn't <laughs> succeed. I have always figured there's three people that know the most about the people in the town in which they live. Well, it used to be four, but there's no longer a milkman. <laughs> the three people are the minister, the funeral director, 
and the paper boy. <laughs> I happen to fill all three positions. <laughs> right after school, I would run home and get my bicycle. The first bicycle I had was a used bicycle. We were poor people. And my uncle had gotten me a bicycle, and the ball bearings in the back wheel did not always catch, so I had to pedal real fast for about 10 pedals, and then it would kick in for about three, and then I'd have to pedal real fast. And I made it around the route in a couple hours and lost a lot of weight. I would meet the man who delivered the papers. His name was Leonard Ferris from Ithaca. I would meet him around 4 o'clock at the Pander Fix-It shop. Some of you may remember Charlie Kachurgis from the Pander Fix-It shop. He was crippled, walked with uh, two crutches, and Charlie was an awful good guy. And I'd sit and talk with him because the papers were often late. So I would go to wait for the papers and they would come and often we would have to put inserts in the paper because the Ithaca Journal didn't do it themselves, they had the paper boys do it. I weighed about 82 pounds, my paper bag weighed 40 pounds. And I had to get on and off my bicycle many times with that paper bag. What I want to do tonight is just take you for a stroll through the eight miles a night that I traveled on a bicycle through the streets, the hills and the valleys of Camden, New York, and take you on a stroll through my paper route. I would pick up the papers at Charlie Kachurgis. And then immediately there was a little house, the uh, fix-it shop was on the corner by the school, White House, they tore down. Behind it was a small home, and my first stop would be to Catherine Crane! <laughs> Some of you may remember her, that's how she talked, scared me right to death. <laughs> I knew it would never be late to Catherine Crane's house because she would tear you from limb to limb. She was a sister to Ted Nicholson and complete opposite of Ted. Where you could love Ted, you couldn't love Catherine. Second stop, the Fountain Inn. Some of you remember the Fountain Inn, vanilla Cokes, cherry Cokes. And I would go in the Fountain Inn and there would sit Paul Blow with his daughter Anne. His wife had died and almost every night they came to eat at the Fountain Inn. Paul was a distant cousin to me, I come to find out later, but Paul almost always made me sit and eat before I could deliver the next paper, because I was so skinny, as you can see, he thought he would fat me up. So most every night, I would have a quick uh, hot roast beef sandwich, or hamburger and fries, or whatever, and Paul would say, better get your papers delivered. <laughs> so the next stop was Ellis's Drugstore. One of my favorite stops. Ellis's Drugstore. Saturday mornings to collect for the paper, I'd walk in and Carmen would say to me, what's new? I'd say nothing that I know. Come on, you know something. Tell me something. You know something. And I'd stand for an hour or so and talk to Carmen and tell her the stories that I had. And one time, uh, Seward, her husband, came out and he said, did you hear what happened last night? I said, no, I didn't, didn't hear a thing about last night. He said, well, you see the funeral home's right across the street there. And it was when the little funeral home was there. And he says, uh, Myron Miller pulled in with a hearse, opened the back door, and 
the casket on the church truck got away from him, came right across the road and ran right into my front door. I said, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. He says, no, Myron was chasing it and it came right into the front door. And he was yelling, stop that coffin. So I said, I gave him a bottle of cough syrup. Carmen and Seward Ellis. Carmen died of an overdose of lipstick. <laughs> Seward, they suspicioned, might have been red hair dye. We weren't sure. <laughs> but they were awful good people, and on Wednesday afternoons, as the noon whistle blew, they would be head out the back door in their white Cadillac. They had a cabin up on Reservoir Hill. They'd go there, they'd go to the city. They were from Endicott area. They'd go up there and she always wore a fur stole, always dressed to the nines. And I remember being in there on Saturday morning and she told me once, if somebody comes in and wants something, and I go like this, make yourself a little scarce. So pretty soon I saw she would be going, like so I'd make myself a little scarce, and it was always a younger man that would come in. She'd reach under the counter, put something in a brown paper bag, and hand it to him. And it was probably five years later that I found out it was condoms. <laughs> to buy a condom. Now they sell them right out on the shelves at the drugstore. And I was amazed because I knew nobody in Cander had sex under 18. <laughs> <laughs> Often as I was there, Mamie LaGrange would come in. Mamie and Bert LaGrange owned the hardware store right next door and that burned a few years, before, uh, year, a few years later. And Manny just loved me. Can't buy the paper from you. Bert likes the Binghamton Press. Oh, boy. But one Christmas she came and she says, I got something for you. And she gave me a silver dollar. Oh, man. An 1873 yep. silver dollar. She says, Bert's got so many coins, he won't miss that one. <laughs> and I still have a silver dollar. <laughs> She says, you hold on to this and yep. you'll always have money. Yep. And I still got the silver dollar. From there, I would have to go to the side door at Claire and Millie Hoyt's. And they'd be standing there getting ready to go bowling in their bowling shirts. They bowled, I think, probably seven nights a week. They loved bowling. Then I would scoot across the ditch before they put the little walk bridge in by the GLF building. Okay. And I'd scoot across there and have to deliver to the one place that I didn't want to go. Leon and Viola Foots. <laughs> Dear people, big dog. <laughs> dog was named Bear. Bear was on a chain and I got so I could throw the paper all the way from the ditch and get it on their front porch. And I only learned that after Bear, which was a huge furry dog, after Bear bit me in the ass once, I decided that it was time to start throwing the paper. So then I went up the street and delivered to uh, Dave and Peg Birch. Some of you must remember Dave and Peg Bird. She was from Ireland, spoke with an Irish brogue. Their daughters were real good friends with me and my sisters. It was always a treat to listen to Peggy talk. She died very young of cancer. And, but it was always a treat, and a special treat, when her brother Billy would come from Canada. His Irish brogue was so perfect, and it was so wonderful to hear the Irishman speak. They had a dog named Babe. It was a big, fat, black lab dog. And 
I'd be there about 10 in the morning, and Billy would just be getting around after being an Irishman the night before. And <laughs> Billy would pass some gas. And he'd look at Babe, the dog, and he'd say, What'd you say, Babe? <laughs> God, your breath stinks this morning, Babe. <laughs> And some of you must remember May Manis. She didn't get the paper, but I can remember my cousin Terry Sullivan lived on Stowell Avenue, and I can remember going up in the woods behind May's house and her shooting over our heads because we were on her property. And some of you may remember when she bought her first car and tried to learn to drive it, it was shipped to her. It was a Renault. And she would go thump, thump, thump down Stoll Avenue and back. And I don't know if she ever did learn to drive it. <laughs> Always wore a straw hat. Come around the corner, Drew Scoy. He was in a wheelchair at the time, bald man. And he was in Kay and Bob House backyard, sort of. And Kay and I would always talk about taking him up and running him down the Cander Hill in the wheelchair with her on the lap. <laughs> then I'd go to Kay's. Kay's here tonight. We'd stand and talk about everything and anything that happened. Then I'd scoot across to Kinney Street. Kinney Street was a little bit of a dangerous street for me. Betty Hilbert lived there. I don't know if any of you remember Betty Hilbert. She drove a little Buick. <clears throat> One winter, it was towards the end of March, it rained most of the morning, then we had a heavy snow. And Betty had backed out of her driveway and got hung up in the snow bank right across the street, back right square into the snow bank. I weighed 80 pounds. <laughs> she was dressed in her fur coat with her earrings and her hat, and she was her rouge, it always looked like somebody slapped her face for about two days. <laughs> she backed across the street and got hung up in the uh, snowbank. And she says, little boy, little boy, little boy, can you help me? <laughs> so I put my paper bag down on by the mailbox, and I hugged and hauled and tugged and on her car. And she had the window part way down, because it was still raining, snowing. Still had the window down, and all of a sudden, those tires caught. <laughs> she took off, <laughs> and I looked like I had just stepped out of the shower. <laughs> She was a good soul, and she told me once, you're the only one in this town I like. I thought, well, at least that's to my favor. <laughs> then next door to her was Beatrice Hollenbeck, former school teacher. And I don't know if you remember Beatrice. Yes. Some of you may have gone to school to her. I don't know, but Beatrice always carried her change in one of those little black purses that you have to snap open. Yeah, right. Well, Beatrice, at some point, had injured this finger, and she couldn't bend it. You remember that? And she had a little tiny pointed fingernail on that, and she would hold that purse while she was paying me for the paper, and I would watch that. <laughs> that finger would... <laughs> I was sure that she was going to blind me with that. <laughs> and 
Yeah, well, never bend it. It just was a little skinny finger with a fingernail on it. From there, I went to Dr. Jakes's for a brief time period, but they too liked the Binghamton Press better. So, um, so they didn't stay with me too long, and uh, that was good because he always made me turn my head and cough. But, um, <laughs> Oh, that was in school. That wasn't on the paper. <laughs> Next door was Eugenia Bergeson. She'd always put out a good cookie for me, and always made good goodies. And at Christmas was the paper boy's wonderful time of the year. She always made sure there was candies and cookies. Great gal. Then I'd have to go around the corner to, well, on the way there, um, I had to stop at Grace and Fox Cardwell's. Grace was my second grade teacher. They adopted a boy by the name of Billy. Some of you may remember Billy. If you don't, you didn't live in Candor. <laughs> when we were in sixth grade, Billy uh, was supposed to make a deposit. His, his, Father owned the locker plant over behind what's now the funeral home. He was supposed to make a deposit, but he wanted everyone to be his friend, so he took the deposit and gave $20 bills to all his friends at school. <laughs> that was Billy. Then I went from Bank Street around the corner. I went to um, Ted Nicholson's house. Beautiful home she had, very hard for her to keep. Her husband, Fred, had um, put the Legion in and had an engineering shop, and had, it went under, and they lost almost everything, but she wanted to keep the house because it was in the family. Ted, I worked with her at the grocery store. She was one of the dearest people in my life. She just touched my heart. She. Whether you know it or not, she was a caddy, a golf caddy when she was young in New York City, and caddied for the Rockefellers. Wow. wow. Touched by fame. <laughs> she had a fella come a while um, after I got going. She had a fella come named Colonel Custer, and he opened in the old red and white story, he opened the Bijou Nickelodeon. Do you remember that? The, Movie theater in Cantor. I had a poster of that, Bill. I had a poster of Colonel Custer. Do you? That's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, he, he ran the Bijou Nickelodeon for a brief time, that was. Then I'd go on up on uh, Spencer Road, had to go all the way up to the Legion. One Saturday I'm there to collect um, at the house's side of the Legion, and that's where George Hewlett lived. And he was Donnie Penny's grandfather. Donnie was one of the first boys that was killed in Vietnam. I get there at the house, and he's laying on the dining room floor, and she's trying to revive him. And we didn't revive him. I was probably 13 years old. But I kept calm enough that I was able to call the ambulance. And many of you remember the first ambulance in Candor. It was Myron Miller's purse. And if it had a yellow light on top that was flashing, it was an ambulance. If the light went off, you didn't make it. It was the hearse. And Myron came, I stayed with her until Myron came, and, uh, and that was the first time I saw a death on the paper route. Mm. Then I would go back down around uh, McCarty Street, and my next stop was Homer and Lyda Dewey's, where Watley's live. Homer and Lyda Dewey's. They were the most wonderful people always left me a cookie with a raisin pressed in the center of it. Great big cookie. You know, it'd take me to across the bridge to eat it. <laughs> One day, she, hot August day, Lida comes out and she says, 
little boy, little boy. <laughs> they all called me little boy because I was little. I weighed 82 pounds. <laughs>
Ellen Dykeman always wore really close cut hair. All the kids nicknamed her Butch. <laughs> and and uh, Ken lost his arm at the uh, in the garden where the funeral home is now, getting leaves out from under the mower, and it started up, and he lost his hand there. And he would he wore a hook, and he would torment the kids with that hook a lot of the time. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So then I would have to go up on Mountain Avenue. I'd go to Rose Gillette's house. And Rose was one of my favorite customers. She would always come out and say, how are you today? I didn't make cookies today, but I have one from yesterday. <laughs> she says, it's been in the cookie jar, so I think it'll be fresh enough. <laughs> and most every night, she had a cookie for me. Rose lived to be, I think, 104. Was that 104? She was a great gal. And there was another gal on Mountain Avenue that probably saved me from going to jail a good many times when I was a teenager. For five years, I went most every night to bingo with Rosie Olmstead. <laughs> I had some of my best escapades with Rosie Olmstead. <laughs> you may remember Rosie Olmstead. She had three sons, Mike, Chuck, and George. Good boys, very good friends with J.K., the local cop. <laughs> Matter of fact, there's rumors that they uh, chained his back bumper to a tree and uh, went by real fast and Jake took off and left his back bumper. <laughs> True story. <laughs> she had six other kids. Rosie taught me to make kalupki. She taught me to make pierogi. But the escapade was going to bingo with Rosie. Come hell or high water, we went to bingo. And she'd call me up and say, you got to meet me on the corner of Church Street, I'm running late. All right, so I ran over, be out of breath, she'd swing by, I'd hop in, away we'd go. One night she, she called and she says, uh, we're going to bingo, but Doc Jake says we got to take Mrs. Simcoe down to the hospital because she can't lay down in the ambulance because she'll die. <laughs> and I said, well, all right. So her daughter Jackie and I sat in the back seat. We went over. Mrs. Simcoe's husband had died and had fallen on her, and she laid there for several hours. And so she was in pretty rough shape. Her lungs were filling with fluid, her heart. She was in her 80s. They were uh, Slovak people. And we got, we got down to Lockwood, and she started, Mrs. Simko started mumbling in Polish. And Rosie, her name was Kanish from down in <coughs> Milltown, I said to Rosie, what is she saying? She says, She's saying the Hail Mary, I don't think she's going to make it. <laughs> Jack and I looked at each other like, oh my God, we're going to witness a passing right here. <laughs> so we got down to the hospital and pulled in where the ambulance does, and she says, Philip, run in and get a nurse in a wheelchair. So I ran in, and I says, we've got a woman in very bad shape out here. We need a nurse, we need a wheelchair immediately. So they came out, ran out. We got Mrs. Simcoe out in the wheelchair, and uh, the, the nurse says, if you'll come in and fill out the paperwork, yeah. Rosie says, I'm late for bingo already. I'm late. <laughs> she ain't my mother. <laughs> so, then one other time, then one other time, Rosie called and says, we're going to be a little late tonight because my car isn't working. But she says, I borrowed a car from Phil King. She used to clean for Phil and Betty King. I borrowed a car from Phil King. He said I could use it to go to Waverly to bingo. And I says, all right. She says, it's one of them foreign cars, a Saab or something like that. So Rosie picked me up. 
and she couldn't shift it good. She, it was sort of the opposite of how you shift a regular car, and she was used to an automatic anyway. So we get going, we got up into the net and turned left to go towards Lockwood, and the car, we went around the corner and it stalled out. <laughs> So Rosie got it started and go. <laughs> Every time she would let the clutch out. <laughs> what are we gonna do, Rosie says. Well, I said, what are we gonna do? Rosie says, you're gonna have to drive. Yeah. <laughs> I said, Rosie, I, I'm only five foot two, and I don't think I've never driven, and I don't think it's legal anyway. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna shove over next to the door. You get it going, and then shove back over, and then we can go. <laughs> She shoved, and Rosie was, um, stout. <laughs> so she shoved over, and my foot was on the clutch. <laughs> I floored it, popped that clutch, and away we went. <laughs> Rosie and I made it to bingo and she hit the jackpot that night. <laughs> Thanks to Phil King. She got there, I got there, and we were all in one piece. So then I'd come out Mountain Avenue on my route and I'd have to go around Park Drive past the Bartos. They took the paper, Helen and John Bardo, he was an attorney. Helen was a scoutmaster. She had Cub Scouts. I was a Cub Scout at Margie Ward. I was Den 4. She was Den 2, Helen was. I was Roar Roar Den 4. <laughs> Helen's was Cock a Doodle Doo Den 2. <laughs> so now you know. You know who had the best then. Come around, and at that time, Peter Pass, who was a janitor, uh, he uh, lived in the little house on Humboldt Street, stopped the paper there to him, and then to Alan and Olive, who, who lived in the back part of that house. Olive just passed this last year, last fall, at 97 years old, 98 years old. Then I would go down to John Jantz and his wife on the corner. Then I'd come around the corner to uh, Peggy Hall. No, I had to go to Lorena Wright's. <laughs> Lorena Wright was my fifth grade teacher. I didn't dare not deliver her paper. In fifth grade, I asked my cousin Becky, how much her turkey weighed for Thanksgiving, and I asked her during a spelling test, and I had to write out 500 times, I will not talk during a spelling test. So at 500, I circled it in gold, because I was done. I wrote it all out, circled it in gold. Do you want to write that again? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. <laughs> So then I'd come around the corner to Peggy Hall, and uh, Peggy had that great big house, did the best she could keep that going for a long time. Then I went to C.B. McCune's. C.B. was always worried that the paper would be wet. He didn't want a wet newspaper, and one time he said, why is this paper wet? And I says, not any wetter than I am. <laughs> I was collecting there one day and he told me the story about how he was getting ready to go on a trip and he had his movie camera on the bed and he didn't realize it was turned on and he knocked it off the bed. 
took pictures of him walking around in his bathroom. <laughs> I tried to buy the tape, but I didn't. <laughs> Jim and John Jennings' house. Then I went next door to Daisy, Jim, and John Jennings' house. John was a tall, lanky fella. He'd go across the road to Father Giles' house because he couldn't swear in his own house, so he'd go across to Father Giles' house and say, Hell damn shit. <laughs> Jim, Jim, I would knock on the door to collect on Saturday morning, and Jim would say, oh, I'm a little tired this morning. I was up last night. Mother's at Eleanor's down in Florida, and I stayed up and watched Dallas. <laughs> she wouldn't let him watch Dallas, but he stayed up and watched Dallas. <laughs> and they were sort of picked on unmercifully, but... Um, there's people here that I could point to that probably are worth some of them, but, um, <laughs> but anyway. Then I go down Maiden Lane to, uh, to the uh, Foundry Street, to my Aunt Helen's house. Go across to Heslop's house where her brother um, Bucky lived. Go on up the street. Then I'd go all the way down Owego Street, stopping at all the houses down through there, all the way down to Frank Wood's house. <coughs> and there was a summer in the 60s where they had repaved the road and it became known as Dead Man's Curve. Because remember there was four accidents that was fatalities. I was delivering the paper at Frank Wood's house and there was this terrible commotion and I could see this huge black car just demolished, oh, and four people were killed. It was the vice president of Ithaca College, Dillingham. Oh, um, right. His wife, do you remember when that happened? And I was the first one at that scene. So I was always at the right place, or the wrong place at the right time, one or the other. <coughs> then I'd come home and go down Church Street, stop at Claire and Johnny Yost's house, and. Um, Sanford's lived on that street at the time, and uh, go up, when I was real young, it was uh, Railroad and Del Ray, or Delaware Avenue, and then it turned to Delray Avenue, because they, we lived on the other side of the tracks, but then they took the tracks out, so I don't know where we lived. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hit all the houses down through there, um, Carl and Rini Hags, and Ozzie and Mary Slaters, and and uh, right on down, right on down through. Foders lived there. She was a wonderful artist, and did did very wonderful painting. Then I would be back to my street. I had to go occasionally down Water Street. I had to go every night down Water Street, but I either do it in the beginning or the end. And Joyce Lushwitz had a dog. <laughs> named Peanuts. <laughs> little dog, little brown dog, sharp teeth. <laughs> I'd come out, I'd carry a stick with me and sort of whack at that dog. That didn't bother that dog. So I'd try to pedal with that big paper bag and try to get up the street while the dog was nipping at my ankles. The life of a paper boy. <laughs> so, and uh, I'd come down Railroad Avenue and of course, I'd just been down through, through uh, there coming home from school because I lived on Humiston Street. We'd always take a shortcut through Shaler's yard, and they had a beagle dog that was this far away from you at the end of its chain. Wow. We'd go along the fence like this, <laughs> and his Aunt Nellie. Nellie, who was crippled, she would come to the door and scream and yell at the dog, leave that little boy alone. I thought, thank God she's here because I would be eaten alive. <laughs> so then we go down, then I went down to uh, Lois Bulls. And uh, there was George and Lois Bull, and Grandma Snyder, her mother, lived with them, and Donnie Rice. Some of you may remember Donnie. He was a real big guy, and he always wore bibbed overalls, and he collected pencils. He loved pencils. 
pencil. Uh, I remember when we were, I was a junior in high school, the St. Mark's got some new pews. They were very heavy oak pews. They came in a great big tractor trailer. Donnie and um, I were working at the store, and Johnny was a communicant at the church, so he says, go up and help him unload those pews. I weighed 82 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> those oak pews were very heavy. Donnie worked for four straight hours oh, wow. unloading those pews. Yeah. Four hours. The man at the end says, what do I owe you? And Donnie would always, uh, like that. He went, you got a pencil? <laughs> he worked four hours for a pencil. One Saturday morning, I went there to collect. Donnie answered the door, and I says, uh, Is your ma here? Yep. <laughs> she going to pay me? Nope. <laughs> I says, Well, why not? And he says, she just died. <laughs> I looked over on the daybed, and there laid Lois dead on the daybed. And Grandma Snyder come out crying, and she says, we're waiting for Dr. Jakes and the coroner to come. Lois just died. And I says, well, I'll collect next week. <laughs> I got out of there just as fast as I could. <laughs> then I went back to my home street. Down by, there was a guy on the corner where uh, the flower shop just opened a couple years ago, Jack Matulatus. He was so good to us kids. He had the only sidewalk on our street, and we could roller skate yep. on his sidewalk, and he didn't care. Yeah. And, of course, we had the clamp-on skates, and we all had sneakers, so they'd never stay on, so oh. we didn't all break our ankles. Yeah. But he also had a player piano. And in the summer, he'd invite us kids in and play that player piano. And it was so amazing to us. So much fun. And I'd go on down the street, and there was uh, Malin and Marshall Hover. We always called her Malin, because we couldn't say Marion. <laughs> Malin Hover, and Clara Nartney Wolf, and uh, Grace German. And across the street was her brother, Hank Hollenbeck, who lived with Jesse Short. <coughs> and uh, they were awful good to us kids, always gave us... Uh, lifesavers and nickels and stuff, and, and just awful good people to us. And then I went home, tuckered out. Yeah. <laughs> Five, almost six years, I was the Ithaca Journal Boy in Candor. Oh. I got my first bike about two months, my first new bike, yeah. about two months after I got the paper route. I went to Owego Murray. And that man in there said, if this young man is working, he deserves to get credit. Oh. And I got my first bicycle, $29.95, and I paid a dollar a week for 30 weeks. Oh. And I, I um, had my first bike, and I went through four brand new bikes, all of them at a Wego Murray. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's, that was... Uh, and I saw some of the most interesting things, like I was, I was waiting for the papers one day and I heard this commotion and down come the roof of the depot. They were tearing it down to make way for the bank and I said to myself, oh, why did they tear that down? Someday they're going to regret that. Yeah. When I was young, it was uh, the library was in it. And Dorcas Beebe would come up and roll, roll up on her bicycle from Church Street. And she had one of those fruit baskets on the back of her bike and this little dog that rode yeah, in it. Yeah. And I was sure they were refilming the Wizard of Oz. Because <laughs> she looked a little like the lady that was on the Wizard of Oz. And the dog was in the back and I thought, oh, they're filming the Wizard of Oz in Candor. <laughs> but they tore that down and now if we had that, we could have a wonderful center of the community be a wonderful place for the historic society to be. There was many things that happened while I was a paper boy that, that I cherish as memories. The people and the places and the things that, that happened have certainly made me part of who I am. 
One Saturday, I'm going across the bridge, and Roger Townsend's car was stopped right in the middle of the bridge. Ah. Red lights flashing. Oh and I looked, and there was a section of the bridge out. Oh. Somebody would hit the bridge and knocked a section of the bridge out. So I came up and was looking down there, and Roger stood beside me, and he was looking down there. And I looked for because there was a car coming from the way of the mill stream. And I looked, and where'd Roger go? <laughs> he just disappeared. He had looked over the bridge and fell over the bridge. <laughs> Law-abiding citizen he was, police officer, and he did swear. <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a good cat, he landed on his feet, <laughs> but landed in the water. Oh. And all of those things happened while I was a paper boy, oh, nice. an Ithaca Journal paper boy. And when I graduated from high school, I was five foot four, and I had gained enough weight that I weighed 122 pounds. Oh. Mostly from all those cookies and, <laughs> and everything that people had given me. Yeah. Um, I also saw the need when I was young to preserve history a bit, so I have a James Way bag that I wrapped some of my treasures in. You might remember James Way, where true value was in a week ago. But, one of the things that I really wanted to show you tonight, that I was very proud of, it was one of the saddest days in my life, but one of my proudest days in my life, because the Ithaca Journal carried this story, but the Binghamton Press had not gone to press yet. But I still have the story. November 22nd, 1963. And I was so proud to deliver the paper that night. I was in my music class at 104. I was... Um, Malcolm Daggett was trying to teach me to play the baritone horn. He tried desperately. <laughs> Mr. Weikert, the assistant teacher, came in and said, the president's just been killed. And Mr. Daggett sworn from me, says, that can't be. Sent me right out of the room, back to my room, and one of the girls in the class was crying her eyes out because she was a Catholic girl and the president was Catholic. He sent me back to the room. He called me down later and apologized for swearing in front of me. But I couldn't wait to get out of the school to see if the paper carried the news. Yeah. And it did. It carried the news of our president being assassinated. And I have the days that followed. Soaring Nation says its farewell. Yeah. <coughs> and it was a cold, rainy night that night very cold, rainy night, and it's like it happened yesterday, and it happened, what, 56, no, 53 years ago that that happened. Then one other paper that I, I had to keep my papers wrapped up and under my bed. Anything I wanted, I kept under my bed because my mother would throw it away. <laughs> And I knew if I put enough stuff under my bed, the boogeyman couldn't grab my ankles. <laughs> <laughs> so, some of you might remember the blackout that occurred in November of 1965, where the grid went down in the whole Northeast. It was in a blackout. And I want to tell you about inflation. The newspaper carrying the president's assassination, November 26th, 1963, price, seven cents. Oh. Two years later, November 10th, 1965, price, 10 cents. It went up 33% in two years, and the paper boy still got the same amount of money. <laughs> There was also, at the same time, the uh, Associated Press put out a book called The Torch's Past, all about the assassination. 
Again, I hid that under my bed. It cost $2. Oh, yeah. $2. And I have that, and it's like new. And I got that because I carried the Ithaca Journal during the assassination. People often wonder why, when I do a eulogy for somebody, how I remember all these things. Oh. It's because I was their paper boy. <laughs> and it makes it so much more personal. It makes it so much more real. And there was a lot of times that things happened. I'd hurry to get through the paper route so I could go to the basketball game or go to a dance or do this or do that. So I'd hurry through and but I always made sure the paper got there on time. There's two other stories. I was coming home one night, cold, blustery February night. Woman lived down in a trailer down past our house and she had plowed into a snowbank. She had been at the mill stream. <laughs> Having a cup of coffee. <laughs> her name was Kezi. Kezi Hollenbeck was her name. And I knew about Kezi because the Ahar boys were friends of mine, and I had to, one time uh, I heard this story how they had to take her home one night because she couldn't drive. And Fred was just learning to drive, and he popped the clutch, and her head went back, and her wig fell off. <laughs> <laughs> and to Jerry's lap in the back seat, so I, I knew that she had a wig. And, well, all you had to do was look at her, and you knew she had a wig. <laughs> so again, I hear an older woman's voice say, little boy! <laughs> <laughs> so she gets stuck in the snowbank in front of the shaler's house. Still had it in drive, wheels just to spin it. If it ever would have took off, it would have went right through their house. Cold, lustry February night. Dark, because it's always dark at 5 o'clock. It's about 6, 6.30. And I says, Kezi, what's happening? Well, I don't know. I got, I got in the ditch. I says, well, I'll walk you home. Let's turn the car off and I'll walk you home. Well, she says, I think it'd be better if you could walk me up to the mill stream. <laughs> and I knew she wanted a cup of coffee. To <laughs> so we got up under the street light on Church Street. Gust of wind caught that wig. <laughs> went down, went down uh, Delray Avenue about 90 miles an hour. Looked just like a tumbleweed. I says, don't move, Kezi, I'll grab your hair. So she stood there with her cane, and, uh, and I went and got her hair, put it back on her head. And I was short, so she had to bend over. sidekicks all through life. Karina and I had been to a basketball game and whenever you go home back then, gas, you could get 50 cents worth of gas in that uh, 61 Falcon that I drove and go forever. So we're coming out of the, we're coming out of the school and Aunt Jen had this huge white um, Pontiac Bonneville. Oh. <coughs> It had just fallen, very light snow just had fallen. She passed where we're coming out of the school and she never turned her wheels at all to go across the bridge. And she hit the end of the bridge. And I said, oh my God, Aunt Jen's hit the bridge, Kareem. Kareem says, right around town till someone gets here. <laughs> Can't do that. What if Aunt Jen's hurt? <laughs> I said, we gotta get 
get over there. So I ran over and opened the door, and their car was sort of in the ditch that they had just recently dug there, that drainage ditch. And their car was sort of in there and into the end of the bridge. And I opened the door, and I says, Aunt Jen, are you all right? And she says, oh, Phil, thank God you're here. I just hit a deer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 